One thing I'll be mentioning a lot as we look at the outside of this aircraft is ECM, which stands for Electronic Countermeasures and essentially protects the aircraft from attack by jamming and confusing enemy radars. They can flood it with a wide spectrum of radio frequencies and smother the return signal or give it false information so the enemy radar thinks it's in another location. On top of the nose is an ECM antenna. Initially it was designed as a high altitude bomber, although when the U-2 was shot down, that changed to a low altitude aircraft that would fly underneath enemy radar. But obviously there's a lot more obstacles when flying low. These two things dropping underneath the front here were designed to help it flying at low altitude and in poor or no light. On the left, or the port side, is an EVS low light television scanner, and on the right side, or the starboard side, is an infrared scanner. These are projected into the flight deck, which you'll see shortly. Behind this dome is a radar warning antenna, and just in front of that is a small cooling air intake, because, again, the electronic equipment all gets very hot, and the air is expelled in the vent below it. And just in front of you, before we enter the undercarriage wheel bay, are several ECM aerials. So really, a lot of these bumps and bulges are to do with ECM. Inside the undercarriage wheel bay, you'll notice a few pipes with insulation wrapped around them. The aircraft is pressurised and they do that by bleeding air from the jet engines. And next up is the massive weapons bay. Up on the other side is a catwalk with a closed hatch. One of the crew members during the flight could actually crawl along here and check that the ordinances had all been dropped. The B-52 has a weapons payload of 31 tons, including bombs and missiles. They can also carry test aircraft, including the Bell X-1, which broke the sound barrier. On the right is a ladder leading up to the top floor, and we'll check that out shortly. In front of you now is the offence compartment. On the left is the radar navigator, who was also the bombardier. Above them are these manual bomb releases if the system jams, and in front of them is the special weapons release, which was for nukes, and thankfully was never dropped from one of these. There's also switches elsewhere. In fact, the pilots, electronic warfare officer, and the radar navigator all had to consent to a nuclear drop via their own individual switches. As we spin around looking towards the back of the aircraft, you'll see racks on both sides where electronic and communication systems are all stored. In the distance is the hatch into the wheel bay and we'll go there later, but first, let's head upstairs to the flight deck. Immediately on the right and looking towards the back of the aircraft are two more seats that form the defence station. On the left is the electronic warfare officer and their role was to control all the defensive equipment including the ECM I mentioned earlier. Spinning around and looking up is the periscope sextant. This was used prior to GPS to work out your position based on the stars. This could be used if other navigation equipment broke or if you needed to fly stealth. And here we are entering the flight deck. What's interesting is that the XB-52 prototype actually had the second pilot sitting behind, similar to the B-47 bomber that preceded it. But it was decided to sit the two pilots next to each other as this would aid communication and you'd also only need single controls. But it partially explains why the flight deck is so cramped. You may recall I mentioned the aircraft's scrubbing system where the wheels could twist. Well, this is where they would do that. It's been scratched off, but here there would be a table with the side wind speed and a recommended crabby angle. Moving forward are the eight throttle levers, which is pretty cool to see. You'll notice the engine four and five are sticking out a little further, and that's because people like to use those two uh, inboard engines to make small throttle adjustments. The fuel management is completely manual, and there's no in-flight engineer, so the pilot would follow a sequence of moving fuel around to try and maintain a center of gravity, while also keeping the fuel in the wings as much as possible, as that helps reduce wing flutter, as I said earlier. Now these two big TV screens are the EVS monitors, which display footage from those two bulbs underneath the aircraft's nose. In poor conditions, the crew can fly the plane purely by using those. And moving over to the captain's seat, you've got the usual gyros, airspeeds and Mac indicators. 